Hello, my name is Adam Kostjan. I head up listings for Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, both for our first north and main market listed companies. We want to make sure that we, on a regular basis, provide good content and thought leadership within different areas to our listed companies. Today is such an opportunity. We have chosen to address the topic of cybersecurity from different angles the investor angle, the regulator angle, uh, and also from an innovation point of view, the innovation that's taking place in the market in order to manage and to ensure that we are dealing with cybersecurity in a safe and predictable way. NASDAQ is a, a global operator of financial marketplaces and cybersecurity is at the top of our mind on a daily basis to ensure a well-functioning and trustworthy marketplace for our listed companies. We look forward to today's discussion. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Finances Bekulman, AMF, and also the innovators such as Ubico and Alphos24 that are participating in today's webinar. In addition, I would like to also thank Christoph Sede, who will be moderating the panel. I hand over to Christoph Sede. Thank you very much. Welcome to this session. Uh, first of all, thank you to Nasdaq and Ubico for jointly taking the initiative to this webinar that addresses a topic that is indeed very urgent. Uh, my name is Gustav Sider. I'm a public relations advisor at Effectiva Media. Uh, before we dive into the topic, let me take one step back for a second. In one of their latest stability reports, Sweden's central bank, Riksbanken, states that cyber risk has become one of the greatest threats to the modern international financial system. Echoing what the Federal Reserve Chairman recently said, quote, cyber attacks are now the foremost risk to the global financial system, even more so than the lending and liquidity risks that led to the, to the 2008 financial crisis. These views are further underpinned by ENISA, the EU Agency for Cybersecurity, which states, cyber risks are no longer an issue for people to deal with individually but are increasingly a social and civic responsibility that affects all sectors of the digital society. Historically, different types of risks have been the focus for investors. In the 1990s, investors began excluding stocks based on business activity like tobacco because it was considered a risk. Today, investors are excluding companies that do not take appropriate action on climate risk. Will investors increasingly evaluate and exclude companies that are not properly managing cyber risk and thus potentially undermining a digital, sustainable, safe, and cyber secure society? Subsequently, more actors and authorities must become involved and share the same forum. And today's webinar is one such forum that brings together experiences and perspectives, both from the private and the public sector. So let me introduce um, the panel today. Um, so today we have representation from the cybersecurity sector by Stina Arensvärd, co-founder and CEO at the Ubico. We also have Martin Jartelius, chief security officer at Outpost 24. We have the legal and public sector perspective by Aron Verständig, senior legal counselor at Finansinspektionen, Swedish Financial Supervisory Authority. We also have the corporate governance perspective by Anders Oskarsson, head of equity, head of corporate governance at AMF. So now I will hand over to Aron Verständig, at Finansinspektionen. Thank you very much, Gustav, and thank you uh, for having me. I will now see if I can manage to uh, provide you with my presentation on the screen right here. We will start from the top, and I hope that everybody is able to see this presentation. Um, like Gustav said, my name is Aron Verständig. I work as a senior legal counselor at Finansinspektionen, which is the Swedish Financial Supervisory Authority. Uh, and I have been doing so for the past seven plus years. Um, and I would speak a bit about our authority, what we do uh, in order to combat 
the cyber threat uh, in the Swedish financial sector. Uh, and also say a few words about the upcoming Digital Operational Resilience Act and other uh, relevant legislative uh, proposals that are currently being discussed. Uh, let me just say a few words about who we are. Uh, Finansinspektionen, like I said, is um, the Swedish financial supervisory authorities. Uh, in different countries, there are different setups when it comes to supervising the financial market. Uh, in some countries, these tasks are divided between several authorities. Um, in Sweden, it is uh, combined in one authority. Uh, Finansinspektionen, our authority, was founded in 1991. Uh, and we are the consolidated supervisor of the entire financial sector. This means that we have the uh, task and the authority to, to supervise all parts of the financial sector, which includes uh, insurance, banking, market, but also macroprudential supervision. Um, we are a public authority, uh, which is governed by the uh, government, the regering, what it says here in, in my Swedish slide, and we report to the Swedish Ministry of Finance. I should also mention that we also have an, another very important authority uh, in Sweden, the Riksbanken, which is the central bank that also that was mentioned by Gustav in, in his introduction. Um, the Riksbank, they don't, uh, they don't have the task to formally supervise the financial market, but they have the responsibility to, to conduct oversight over um, over the financial market to ensure that there is financial stability. Uh, and the Riksbank, Bank, the central bank, they are an authority uh, that reports directly to the Riksdag, which is the Swedish parliament. Um, this is uh, our beautiful office, which uh, we are not able to occupy right now. Um, this is what we are supposed to do. This is sort of the uh, our task, as it is formulated by the Swedish government, the Finansinspektion should contribute to a stable financial system, financial stability, that is characterized by high level of confidence with well-functioning well markets, while also providing high level of protection for consumers, which means that we have, um, to be honest, many tasks. We are supposed to work for, for financial stability, um, a financial system that, that has a high level of confidence and well-functioning markets, and thirdly, uh, also a, a high level of protection for consumers. And from last year, we've also been given a fourth, fourth task, and that's also to uh, ensure that the financial system uh, is sustainable. Uh, so we are also doing a lot of work when it comes to sustainability. Um, so what do Finansinspektionen actually do? So our main task is to grant authorizations. Everybody who wants to conduct a financial activity in Sweden needs a, some kind of, of a authorization by Finansinspektionen. And naturally, if you want to run a bank, you need a very advanced uh, authorization, which usually takes years to, to finalize. Um, and, and we have a number of smaller enterprises that perhaps would require a much uh, more, uh, much simpler um, authorization from us. Currently, we conduct supervision over about 2,000 uh, financial companies in Sweden. Uh, they are very different in size, uh, but uh, that, that, that's how it looks like right now. Uh, apart from granting authorizations, we also issue regulations. We have a specific mandates by the Swedish government to issue regulations uh, in certain uh, in certain cases, um, and and also when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, we have over the last couple of years issued a number of of regulations that are binding. Uh, thirdly, we also exercise uh, supervision, which means that after we have granted an authorization to a company, that company is under our supervision, which means that we have a very broad authority to see if that company is actually following the rules. Uh, and, and if the company does not follow the rules, we, we have the power to issue sanctions against that company. I should also mention that actually a very big part of our work is also to assist the government. And I will, I will come back to this later in my presentation, but we are also the government's expert 
authority when it comes to the financial markets, which means that when the government or the Ministry of Finance uh, within the EU framework or within another framework are um, negotiating regulations, we are usually uh, very involved in this issue. We are usually provide the Swedish government with information, with assessments, uh, when it comes to proposed re regulation, how they will affect the, the financial markets. And in this regard, uh, we very much value our uh, contacts and our dialogues with uh, organizations that represent the Swedish financial industry that also provides us with information so that we are better, um, better suited in, in making our uh, our recommendations to, to the government, to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, so that is very, very uh, short about what we do. I can just mention that we are, uh, when we started in 1991, we were about 150 people. Uh, and today we are uh, about 600, 650 people. So this is an authority that over the last couple of years has grown uh, a lot, and this is very much due to the fact that since the last financial crisis in 2008, 2009, the amount of financial regulations has grown exponentially, which means that uh, it, has, it has put a, a burden on the financial companies, but it's also put a burden on uh, the uh, national competent authorities uh, that, that conduct supervision. So, so we have uh, grown uh, quite a lot. When I started in 2014, we were about 350 people. And, and like I mentioned, we are somewhere between 600 and 650 people uh, today. Um, uh, an interesting question is why are we in the business? And, and when I mean the business, I, I mean, why are we doing uh, anything when it comes to cybersecurity? We tried to answer this question in the report that, that we published in March this year, which is on our uh, website. Uh, the report is in Swedish, but there is a English summary. Um, and, and the sort of main question that we tried to answer is why is Finansinspektionen in the first place engaged when it comes to issues on cybersecurity? Um, and First, I, sh I should say, I think the, the, the uh, primary answer is that it concerns financial stability, especially if the company that is targeted by a cyber, uh, by cyber attack is a systemically important financial institution, such as a major insurance company, a, a large bank, or, or a um, stock exchange, or a clearing, or a CCP, or an, an, any company like that. Uh, an attack against such a company may very well uh, endanger uh, the financial stability in Sweden. And in, in the same way as we are conducting supervision regarding uh, levels of capital or at other, in, other important issues regarding financial companies, we also need to make sure that uh, the companies have proper, uh, have, have a, a proper le level of resilience uh, so that they can withstand a, a, a cyber attack against them. Um, and what we have seen, or and this, this is also not, I, th I don't think that this uh, conclusion is unique by Finansis Bekonen, is that there, there, there are negative externalities, which means that an individual financial company, when they are determining the level of uh, precautionary measures, they might take into account the, uh, the consequences that that individual financial company might face if they are hit by a cyber attack, but they are not uh, in usually uh, taking into account the consequences that the entire financial system or the, the Swedish society in general might face if, if that company is being um, targeted by, by a cyber attack. And this uh, gives us a, a um, very good reasons to, to be involved in this business, if you'd say so. And this, um, li like I said initially, in, in the same manner as we are supervising how companies, financial companies are dealing with other kinds of risks, uh, this is, according to, to our opinion, this is another uh, risk that, that we need to make sure that the companies are 
identifying that the companies are, are handling. So that's the reason why we are uh, involved in this area. That's a bit uh, about the introduction about who we are and why we are in this business. Um, if we are to move on and say a few words about um, what is going on right now, I think one, one of the most interesting uh, pieces of legislation that has been uh, proposed in the last uh, few years on this topic is the DORA Act. DORA is short for Digital Operational Resilience Act. Um, and it was proposed by the European Commission uh, in September last year. Uh, the DORA is uh, in the form of a regulation. I don't know how uh, well informed you are about the different kinds of legislative acts that, that the European Commission can propose, but basically they can propose either a directive, and the directive means that uh, the member states are required to implement the rules in their national legislation. But a regulation means that the regulation, regulation in itself becomes directly applicable in the member states. And this is a regulation, which means that when the DORA Act is finally adopted, um, it will become directly applicable in all member states. Um, I can just say a few words about, I, I will go into more details about the regulation, but I can just say a few words about the timeline. Like, like I said initially, the DORA was proposed in September last year under the leadership of the Portuguese uh, presidency of the European Council. Uh, there are currently uh, negotiations regarding the text uh, and the negotiations are right now they're done separately within the Council. The Council consists of the member states uh, and the European Parliament. Uh, and as far as I have uh, understood the negotiations uh, the separate negotiations in the Council and the European Parliament are almost finished. I think they are, they are due to be finished, finished this month or even next uh, week. Uh, but what will happen afterwards is that the European Parliament and the Council will negotiate with each other. So this is the strange thing about uh, the EU and how they uh, actually make legislative decisions is that in Sweden, uh, the government proposes to the parliament and then the parliament makes the decision. In the EU, the commission proposes uh, and the parliament and the council are making a joint decision, which means that they need to, to agree with each other. And that uh, uh, negotiation, which is called the trilogue, will start uh, under the next presidency, under, um, which, which will commence after the summer. And, uh, I believe that this act will be uh, negotiated and decided upon uh, by the end of this year. It's, it's I think, the most reasonable estimations what I have heard. Uh, and then it will become applicable uh, about one or two years after that. So this is something that the rules that I am, uh, I would just say a few words about, they will uh, enter into force uh, I, I would guess by, by uh, 2023 as the earliest. So uh, what is the door about? First of all, it is a, a financial markets regulation, which means that this act concerns financial entities. It has a very broad scope, which means that it concerns all kinds of different financial uh, entities, banks, insurance companies, um, securities firms, uh, and so on. Uh, initially, it was also proposed that accountants should be uh, within the scope of the DORA, but uh, as far as I have understood from negotiations, they have been excluded. But it is a very broad uh, uh, scope, and uh, it, is ex it has excluded also micro companies, which means companies, I think, that they have below 10 or 15 employees, so very small companies are not uh, applicable uh, or not within the scope of the DORA. The DORA also contains a proportionality clause, which means that a, uh, the authority that conducts supervision can are, are able to, to um, uh, have uh, mi minor, can, can make some minor changes when it comes to uh, smaller companies that perhaps don't, don't need to, to fully uh, adhere to, to all the rules. But we will see uh, when we have the final text. Uh, I think one, one of the most important uh, articles of the DORA Act is it, it places a very big responsibility 
on the management board, the, man the management body, which is usually the board in, in a company. Uh, and it requires the management body to define and identify all kinds of different cyber risks and to make sure that these risks are addressed, um, either by uh, employing people or by themselves actually uh, managing these risks. Uh, the DORA also requires the setup uh, and, and that the financial companies maintain resilient ICT systems and to that minimize the impact of ICT risks. How, what this means uh, in general or, or in, in more concrete, we, we will find out, I think, further down the road because financial regulation usually, when it comes on this, uh, uh, when it is issued by, by the Commission, uh, in the first place, usually on, on a very abstract uh, scale. And I think many of you perhaps would like to know exactly what this means to you. And, and I, I don't think that I or anyone else will be able to, to answer this question, because usually the DORA, such as other uh, financial regulations, uh, provide principles and, and general objectives, and then confer upon the European supervisory authorities to actually issue more, issue more direct more specific regulations as to exactly what is required by, by financial institutions. And this will be, we will see further down the road. The door also contains uh, rules on reporting and testing. A reporting, which would be an obligation by the financial entities to report to the relevant authorities about cyber incidents. And testing that uh, authorities in the respective member states uh, are required to, to conduct tests of the financial entities um, and, and, and their resilience against cyber threats. Um, the DORA also contains an oversight mechanism of critical third-party service providers. So third-party service providers, they're not usually financial companies. It could be uh, larger uh, companies that, that provide services to financial institutions such as Amazon or Google and other, and other similar companies. I should just emphasize the word critical, which means that this is not intended to, to include uh, smaller or even medium-sized institutions. It is supposed to, to include only the largest, the, the most critical third-party uh, service providers. Which companies that will be included uh, as a critical third-party service provider will be determined further down the road by the European supervisory authorities. They are supposed to uh, designate who these companies are. Um, and this is uh, very short about the DORA, uh, about the DORA regulation. So let's see what my time is. Um, I should just also mention that there are other uh, important initiatives that are currently being discussed. The Commission has also proposed an update of the NIS Directive and Critical Entities Resilience Directives. And I should just mention that these uh, directives are applicable on the uh, systemically important institutions. The, the, the current NIS Directive uh, in Sweden is only applicable on the major, uh, the largest bank and, and the uh, central clearing, uh, the CCP. Um, and also the fact that we have seen a lot of cases where the DORA Act and the NIS and the CER Directive, they actually uh, concern the same topics. Um, and uh, the DORA now includes a provision which makes it uh, as we would say in, in the legal term, lex specialis, which means that it is, a, uh, it is supposed, so, so if the NIS directive and the DORA is applicable on the same company, uh, the DORA Act takes precedence over the NIS directive and the CER directive. Uh, I should just mention in Sweden uh, right now, there is a very big discussion uh, regarding civil defense. Uh, in March <clears throat> this year, uh, a a public inquiry uh, presented um, a report on a new structure for civil defense. Uh, and civil defense, the new structure for civil defense will also include financial services. Uh, the proposal that was presented in March this year uh, 
includes a, a um, setup that uh, would mean that financial services are a part of the civil defense. Um, Finansinspektionen is designated as the uh, authority in charge of making sure that the financial sector is prepared for a major crisis or for uh, a war, which means that uh, we will naturally make sure for the down the road to see exactly what this means, but uh, very much pointing to the fact that Finansinspektionen will, will take the lead in the sector and to, to make sure that uh, all kinds of different precautions uh, are made in order uh, for the financial sector uh, to, to function even during a crisis or during a war. Uh, and there's also, I should also mention uh, that there is uh, currently an update on the Swedish Protective Security Act in Swedish, it's called Säkerhetsskyddslagen, uh, which is an act that concerns all companies and all authorities that are um, conducting uh, businesses that are important for the security of, of Sweden. And this in includes financial companies. Uh, and these financial companies or other companies need to make sure that they adhere to these rules. And from December 1st, Finansinspektionen will become the, uh, will, will be given the task to conduct supervision uh, according to this act over financial companies, that the financial companies, for example, when they outsource um, tasks to other companies, that they are actually following the rules of the uh, Swedish Protective Security Act. Um, uh, as uh, you have heard, there are a lot of uh, things happening right now. We are working quite a lot to, to um, to see how all these new rules will impact the Swedish uh, sector. And uh, I think it's fair to say that over the last couple of years, we will see a increase uh, when it comes to um, regulation regarding cybersecurity, not least because of the fact that we are living in a new era with, with new kinds of threats uh, against financial companies and against other companies. So, so I think that. Uh, we will see more of this uh, in the years to come. I think I will uh, stop there and uh, hand the word back to uh, Gustav. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aron. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Uh, I'm sure that some of these topics we can perhaps uh, come back to in the end in our panel discussion. But for now, uh, I'd like to hand over to Stina Arensvad, who is a co-founder and CEO at Ubico. Welcome. Thank you. I am going to share my screen here. Thank you. So um, more than a decade ago, I founded a company called Ubico with the vision to one day enable one authenticator to any number of services making secure login easy and available for everyone. And with that vision, um, we've moved part of our team here to California, which I'm calling in from, uh, to work with the internet thought leaders on developing a global standard. And what is the standard we are, that we have developed and why did we need to develop it? I'm gonna share in my next slide. Hackers destroy shareholder value. I think we have understood that by now. Uh, here are six examples from major brands um, from the last decade. The Target CEO, Target, one of America's largest retail companies and was the first Fortune 100 company where the CEO had to be fired because he had not taken care of this internet security for the company. 40 millions of their customers, uh, customer data and credit cards was breached. And the fines beyond that was many millions of dollars and the trust, the damage, um, you know, the cost of that is it was was real. Um, Verizon uh, decided to buy Yahoo a few years ago. But during the time they're going to buy the company, uh, Yahoo had a breach. And when the final uh, price for the company was settled, 
it was $350 million less because of the breach. The Colonial Pipeline that we've heard about just recently, um, the CO paid a ransom to ensure that the infrastructure and oil and gas and you know, fuel for cars and airplanes and big part of United States was not disrupted. Uh, here in Sweden, we had security company Gunnebo uh, that had a breach and very sensitive information for well, some of Sweden's most critical security buildings, including bank walls, was leaked and exposed on the internet. That definitely did not hear, you know, help with their brand. A very sad story is the Finnish clinic. Um, it's a healthcare organization in Finland that had 3,000 people. They had a breach um, and um, psychiatric patient data was exposed on the internet. Today, that company no longer exists. It had to file bankruptcy. They could not live with the aftermath of this damage. So, and then finally, which I'm gonna circle back to is Google. They were exposed by a state and station nation <laughs> nation state hackers who got into their database and stole IP, intellectual property and software that is the core innovation that Google is built on. Sergey Brin said when that happened, that cannot happen again. And that's actually a reason why I'm speaking here today. So there's one common dominator for all of these six breaches. And I hope that my slide works now. Yes, um, it's phishing. All of these were exposed for stolen login credential. And the number one security breach today, phishing. So here are the various attacks that companies can be exposed for today. And we all are exposed for our computers and phones. No one is completely safe. Uh, we start with the, the most common attack, the account takeover. Today, we're not just seeing the, the sort of the standard or the old school, I would say, phishing attacks where you have to be tricked uh, to download a PDF or open a link. Today, there are much more advanced phishing attacks where we, we call them spear phishing or man in the middle attack. And they target specific users and they hijack the session. They hijack when you're logging into a bank without you knowing they've already taken over your com computer. They've already taken over your login credential as you send codes to the bank. And they are, they're, they're getting access to the account. This is um, um, a kind of breach that have hit thousands of companies just the last few years. And Twitter is probably one of the more, um, more known brands who have it's been exposed for this problem. Uh, we hear about ransomware every week now. Ransomware is a kind of attack where the, the hackers get access to data, software um, systems, and blocks it. Uh, and they say, no, I'm not going to get it. You're not going to get it back unless you give some kind of money. Spyware is malicious code that, that gets into your computer and monitors and steals stuff for you. And then we got the various Trojans, viruses, and also, which a lot of people don't know, and this is the scary part, it's something that you may have already bought, but it could be a malicious code that's implanted, a backdoor that's in your computer or in your phone or in some kind of hardware device that you already bought that has a backdoor where a malicious actor is spying on you. Well, <laughs> not very easy to, um, to be protected against those. Uh, another very common attack is just social engineering. It's the most, the least sophisticated. Actually, someone just call, calling you up and they say that you're you and you give them away the data, mostly over a phone. A lot of people do that. 
We got various web application attacks uh, where there's malicious code that gets into your systems. We got the insider attacks, which is actually not from the outside. It's someone who works at the company, someone who just can't take their fingers away from some interesting data and, and see here's an opportunity for me to make an extra salary. Or it could be someone who's hired to be in your company and, and steal data from you. And then we got the denial of service attacks. And that's when the hackers do everything they can to overwhelm your system, overwhelm your network with so much tra traffic that your services go down or they send too much data to a specific application so that application goes down. So they not, don't necessarily breach and take information, but they block you from operating, which is a, a major problem in today. Well, on constantly connected world. So with that, I'm going to go back to the number one problem, stolen login credential. Today, we're seeing cybercrime expected to be more than $6 trillion in cost for the, for the world. It's doubled since 2015. One in three companies will experience a breach within two years. And over 80% of all these breaches are going to be due to a stolen login credential. And here is um, a chart that uh, we found from Google showing that what we are used to know as the most common attacks that we protected ourselves with virus protection or with firewalls, um, those attacks are actually not as common anymore because they're starting to be built into computers and phones. Uh, if you're using a Microsoft system or using Google system or Apple system, those are already directly built in. So those are decreasing. What is increasing is phishing. And that's exactly, as I said, what happened at Google. Sega Brin stepped up and said, we need to, to do something. We need to do, we need to protect our users. We need to protect our IP. We can no longer be in the cloud. And he assigned his security team to go out in the world and look for the best security. And they started looking at smart cards, traditional smart cards uh, that are proven to stop the more advanced phishing attacks. The problem with these smart cards, they need a reader, they need a client software, they need a driver. They, they're not really designed for the modern web. They're not designed for the phone. And the whole infrastructure around the smart cards are costly and cumbersome, and they're only designed to work for one service. So then, you know, you need a hardware thing for that service. And then if you're gonna log into another service, you need another hardware thing. And then you end up with, you know, a whole, you know, whole pocket of stuff and you still cannot access everything. So that really didn't work out so well. So the other options that Google had to choose between was some kind of one-time password authentication tokens, sort of these bank authentication tokens that we've all been using in various capacities, or um, a, a phone application that you download on your computer, or a traditional username and password. The problem with these solutions is that they're no longer secure enough for these advanced phishing attacks. And that's when we had our lucky chance, we had Yubico. Google had just started buying our first product. It's a little YubiKey. It looks like this. You put it on your keychain. And um, it didn't have all the security features that we wanted because we actually need to work with Google to create them. Um, but they started buying this product and we started a dialogue uh, with their security team of how we could enable the vision that Ubico was set up to do. How can I have one single key to work across any number of services and it just works to my Google account, to my bank account, to my government account. And um, so this is what we did. We created the YubiKey and a an authentication standard that is today not named FIDO. We started developing it with Google and eventually all the leading tech giants joined this initiative. 
So this is how it works. You got the key, you plug it into your computer, and you log into a service that have already made support. And there's hundreds of services out there that have made support for this standard. It's not just our product, but we are the leading, the pioneer, the, the core inventor behind it. In the security setting, it will be called security key. Then you just touch the, the, the button here, which is a little touch button that shows that you're a real person, not a Trojan that trying to hack out. You have to be you know, a human being, or you tap it at the back of your phone because it works with, with near field communication. And once you set this up, with your computer and phone, most of the services will not require you to add the UBK again. It just works. So here we have a solution where I can log in. When I'm logging into my Gmail, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm accessing my phone. I'm clicking on the, on the Gmail app. And here I've got access to all my emails. I have not done anything. It just works. But I couldn't do this by ourselves. We actually needed to build in uh, this technology directly into computers, platforms, and browsers to get that tight, seamless work out of the out of the box experience. So, Google had this devastating breach, um, but uh, then they put out a report where they shared that they were now using YubiKeys in various form factors. Actually, they gave two to three YubiKeys to every employee at Google, and. 350,000 users, they had not one single account takeover. They had 92% support reduction, which meant that there were tens of millions of dollars were saved. And it was a very simple reason to this, is that when you only have one authenticator, if it is a bank authentication token, it's a YubiKey, it's a phone, you will lose or break it or something will happen and then people can't log in. And that's a cost. When people can't log in, they call support, support, they call support and that's maybe a $30 cost you know, running uh, per, per incident. So now they, by having two or three keys, you know, the support cost went down. Tens of millions of dollars have been saved. It was four times faster or even more to log in than using a phone app that they actually was using before where you first have to open the app and you have to uh, change, move a code or you have to accept something. This really just worked out of the box. Um, I'm gonna share uh, the, another uh, part of this study is basically what they, they, they um, compared the YubiKey against was um, one-time password uh, prompt, which like a push app where you, you send a one-time code through your phone, a secondary email, SMS code, or a secondary phone number. And you can see the results that all the others had some kind of phishing risk. Uh, it was when uh, Google published this study when a lot of other companies says, we also want this. And here is just an example of all the companies have made support, not only for this standard, but some other authentication protocols that we've added to our YubiKey. Uh, so I can today have my key to log into all my system. I log into my computer, I log into my single sign-on system, to my password manager, to my developer tools, to my corporate applications. And I don't have to bother about having a lot of different codes and, and devices and things to think about. It just works. So uh, what was the inventions that we came up with? We started uh, realizing together with Google. Google said, hey, you, we need a smart card. In smart cards, there's something called the public key crypto, which is the more advanced form of encryption, which is a more tighter integration between the, the software, the server, and the user. So it stops with what we call the man in the middle attack. We decided we need to use that. We also added together with Google, actually it was an invention that we, we came up with together with our security engineers, is that once you register this key to an, a, 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 a service, it has to be the same URL that you log into every time. So it can't be a different URL. If it is a different URL, it will just say no. This is one of the most common phishing attack that a user is tricked to go to a different URL and you don't see that that's happening. 
So that is, you know, that was a critical invention. The other one is that I already show you, you have to touch the device. So you show that you're a real user at that tech computer with the key. You can't be in another room. You can't be in another country. The core invention, however, that really made the difference for this invention is the one uh, authenticator to any number of services without sh any shared secrets. That had not happened before. Before every authenticator had to go through a single sign-on service, like a Facebook Connect, like login with Google or some kind of, of IM solution. But this one actually allowed a YubiKey to sign up into a Facebook Connect and to your bank and to your government service. And none of these services will share any information and we will not sit on any information. So we got privacy and security. There is no big brother sitting and overlooking all of how these keys are being used. Uh, we also put in the importance of backup. We learned about that to, to reduce support calls. Because you know what the reality is, if you don't have a secure backup, the, 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 the attackers, they will find the weakest link. I mean, if you have an SMS together with a security key, the SMS will be breached. And, and the security is as low as the SMS. The, the work that we needed to do to really scale this and make it into a global standard, we had to get all the leading platforms and browsers on board. First, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Firefox, Opera, you know, Facebook, Amazon, you know, all the leading banks, all of these had to be on board to build this standard so it just works. And it took 10 years to get there, but we have succeeded. And that's why it works. That's why it's easy. Because if things are not easy and just works out of the box, it is actually the biggest security risk. People can have a lot of security, but if it's not easy, people won't use it. If it just works and it's there seamlessly integrated, that's when it's scalable. And that's when it's good security. So with that, I am moving forward to here's just another invention. We took the same hardware. Uh, in the form of the minimized version of our YubiKey, and we designed that to protect sensitive data that sits on servers. This is more for physical protection and encrypt data that sits in servers in a database. But this is something that is also covers a lot of the different security threats out there. These are the two versions of our, of our products that we have, the YubiKey and the HSM. And I'm going back to this slide. We saw it in the beginning of the deck. We got the account takeover, we got the malware attacks, we got the social engineering, we got the web applications. Uh, if you look at technologies like strong authentication, like the YubiKey or the, like the HSM, they actually, these are technologies that prevent the vast majority of all breaches. Only breaches, are the kind of breach, it's actually not a breach, but the kind of attacks that is a significant disruption to business are the, are the denial of service attacks, and of course, insider attacks. If you give your employee a YubiKey and you trust them and they're going and, and steal your data, that's nothing that we can do anything about, unfortunately. So I am gonna wrap up my presentation today and just say, hey, we, we heard Aaron talking about uh, the important regulations that we see in Europe, uh, regulations and acts that company must comply with you know some of these if you don't comply with them you're going to be in jail or you're going to have high fines and and these regulations we are seeing an increase in you know importance on cybersecurity. and so the coming years it's not just going to be hey like like gdpr today hey you should probably do something with the data you collect and to protect it there will be more and more requirements on cybersecurity, and some already have that, like the PSD, Payment Service Directive, it already requires two-factor authentication in order for you to be in business for some of your um, staff members and servers. So, and here, if you want to do business in the US, there are um, another set of regulations. Uh, there's some, the SOX one was actually <laughs> developed after the WorldCom Enron brand um, uh, attack, or what we call it, the scandal that we had some years ago. And it, every company that is listed on the US stock market will need 
to comply with that. And the cybersecurity requirements are growing increasingly. So we see at Ubico as a security company, we see it, it, a number of companies coming and saying that we need to comply with these um, regulations. Um, there are also specific regulations that are targeting specific verticals, like HIPAA is for healthcare to ensure that you store and secure healthcare data securely, and the FedRAMP that is for US military. Uh, we're seeing a great initiative here in Sweden. It's the Swedish Armed Forces, uh, the security police, uh, uh, that have put up something called Myndigheten för Samhällsberedskap that are now putting together some really interesting um, initiatives on stepping up you know, security initiatives in Sweden. I look forward to hearing more about that. And here is my final slide. Um, this is to you companies, to the board. It's not too overwhelming difficult to get really good security. Um, you do pro is, is you invest in the proper cyber security solution. They don't necessarily have to be very expensive. Some of them are already built in. I personally, I'm sitting on a, a Google systems. In Google system, they have built in virus protection. They have built in encryption. They've built in a lot of the stuff that you initially have to, and the same with Microsoft systems. It just works. Uh, the, the one thing that you need to turn on that is just not, doesn't work by default, you actually have to do something active is the two factor. And there are built in two factor authentication in a lot of the platforms today. Please turn them on. If you want even better two factor authentication, you should, you may consider something like the YubiKey, but having some kind of two factor authentication is far better than just a username password. Of course, you need to stay compliant with regulations or you will be fine. And many of those regulations will require you to step up your security. And here is a very simple, very simple advice. Please only give access to the critical people. The critical people in your company should have access to critical data. Don't give access to everyone. It's actually a very common attack that people just like, oh, here is our corporate network. Everyone cannot get access to it. You shouldn't be so naive. Don't trust anyone in the company. And their company who open up that for their contractors and interns and, you know, be very, very specific who get access to specific data. That will actually help you, you know, keep a lot of things safe. Uh, and then you can educate the employees. You know, I would suggest every time you, em you employ a new person in the company, you tell them, here is your business card, here is your email, and here, by the way, are a couple of things you need to know about cybersecurity. <laughs> and what do they need to know? Okay, they should use two-factor authentication. They should update their computer with the latest software. They, sh they should use antivirus software unless they're already using some cloud provider where it's built in. Uh, as I said, Google, Microsoft, Apple have already started to build that in. You don't even have to download it. I'm not, I haven't used the antivirus software for years because I'm using things that are built in. And if you're not using a cloud service, please take backups. Pa backups will ensure that if you have a ransomware attack, which God forbid, but let's say it happens, then that de data isn't hijacked uh, and you can continue to operate. So I think that was actually my final slide. I am going to stop sharing. And uh, back to you, Gustav. So thank you so much, Stina, for a very insightful uh, presentation. Now, I'm so happy to hand over directly to Anders Oskarsson, who is Head of Equity and Head of Corporate Governance at AMF. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. And especially thank you, Stina, for an excellent uh, show. Um, my name is Anders Oskarsson and um, I'm head of equity at AMF. AMF is a pension company for the blue collar workers. When it comes to investing, we are the fourth largest owner at the Stockholm Stock Exchange. And we are invited to 35 nomination committee and nomination committee, as you know, you, they prepare the AGM and suggest the board members. We have 90 holdings uh, at the Stockholm Stock Exchange and we have invested, invested approximately 230 billion Swedish kroner. 
one of those, those things that I realized during the, the, the latest year is, is that the, the company is not aware of the treasure uh, they are holding in uh, the management system, how to make money out of uh, computer systems, uh, data systems, or the data they actually hold uh, among the, the clients or how to do business. And when we invest in company, we think this is a very uh, important question to uh, discuss with the uh, management team or uh, as we can do as lead, speak to the uh, board uh, members or the chairman. Something called ESG, Environment Social Governance. I think you all know that, but I say that the first capital letter in that word is G. If we get control over the G, we can do the other things as well. So AMF is a large shareholder and a large player at the Stockholm Stock Exchange. As I said, we are uh, taking part of 35 nomination committees. So what we do with that uh, possibility is, of course, to nominate the, the board members and see that they get pay and see if we got the right auditors etc. But what you also do is take up another discussion with the chairman or with the board members is the cyber security. Again, this is a very important asset for the company and we like to mention that for the uh, chairman and for the board members. And if things will happen, as uh, Stina showed on slide two, hackers destroy shareholder value, we will hold them the responsibility. Because again, uh, I wouldn't say that the share member, or share, chairman, or a, a board member do need to have all the knowledge to uh, to what, what, what come, become to the cybersecurity situation. But they need to show me as an owner, representing uh, owners, is that they have done all they can that preventing this. And again, this world has been turning quite difficult. When I was a little kid, I read the comic magazine, Donald Duck. I knew every time the guy, the Bjorn Ligan with a red sweatshirt uh, and blue pants entered, I know bad things were coming. Uh, when I work as a, as a local bank branch uh, in the 90s, I knew every time that the get, uh, man with a gun stepped into the, uh, to the bank and shouted out, this is robbery, I knew this was a bad thing happening. But unfortunately, we don't see how these people look today. They are hidden behind computers and they're doing a lot of work and they uh, develop their way of doing business, so to say. And therefore, we need our company to pre prevent and to push ideas so they are prepared. So things like uh, happen to Gunnebo won't be acceptable or happen to Mekonomen. Uh, they were uh, shut out of the system and couldn't do business. And therefore, we need to realize, uh, or I realize at least, that the, the, the data, the, um, the information the company holds is a treasure and therefore it needs to be saved or secured. So what we do again is that we speak to the management, we speak to the um, chairman or the board member and mention this is a critical question. We ask them to report back to us and say, what have you done? And as you have seen, uh, Stina showed us uh, right now, there are solutions out there. So it's not an excuse and say, we didn't have the time to do anything, or we thought we have the possibility to um, have this data secured. But that is not the fact. I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that we see that uh, several companies are not taking this uh, issue uh, for, for real. They th think they have a good system, but they will wake up and then we will have a, a situation where shareholders will lose money and that is not acceptable. Uh, so that is what we do as a big shareholder. We think it's a really important question and uh, we see that uh, there are way how to protect the, their assets. And uh, we are will continue to work on this issue because it's not one uh, one way of, of fixing this. This is a continuing working with those issues. So that's from a perspective of, of an investor. Back to you, Gustav. 
thanks a lot. Very, very interesting, Anders. Um, so I will then hand over to our uh, fourth and uh, final speaker, uh, Martin Jartelius, Chief Security Officer at Outpost 24. Welcome. Thank you, Gustav. And uh, so it says 10 minutes, but I hope I can use it. 15 as we intended. I come from a rather different world, world than most of the other presenters. I'm here representing the more technical or darker side of what we've been discussing. I come from Alpus24. It's a cybersecurity company uh, founded and operating out of Sweden. Uh, we're in the space of vulnerability management, which essentially means we provide solutions for scanning a network or cloud environment and finding all these misconfigured, weak passwords, uh, outdated systems, essentially points where your infrastructure is at risk of breaching. Um, we also have um, a red team. Uh, the red team comes from uh, essentially a military perspective where we have a red and blue team where the red team would uh, emulate the attackers and the blue team would be the defenders and then you enact different scenarios um, on these uh, offensive operations. Uh, and the ask hacker division, uh, I'm the chief security officer, which means that I do work security at a security company in an environment where I house about 50 hackers and an internal bug bounty as well. So, of course, we also use the, uh, well, now they're out of focus, but the Yubi keys, for example, for our administration. And it's a, it's a piece of the puzzle, uh, as are many uh, other things to make the whole. This is just a selection of stuff from the news. Um, what we can see from the last year, um, we see that there's uh, ransomware, ransomware, ransomware everywhere. We see huge data leaks, we see phishing, and we see leakages of data records. These are taking up most of the uh, media space and attention. We also see here in my examples that we have MITRE, who's a, an organization where we track different forms of vulnerabilities, but they also track threat actors. Today, they are counting 122 threat actors. And uh, these are government state organizations, but also the ransomware gangs, as we talked about them today. Um, the predominant bits, it's ransomware, more ransomware, and ransomware as a service, of course. Um, we also see the legacy outdated systems being one of the drivers here. Um, what I will be talking about today for the next few minutes is what we usually talk about, like basic hygiene, things everybody should be doing. Um, but I also dry ran this with a range of board members um, who I have access to. And I've changed a bit from being a more compliance and legislation focused bit uh, over to some practical examples to prove my point, if we can use that phrase. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about Tybo, which is essentially uh, threat intelligence based ethical red teaming uh, and its application to uh, especially financial industry today. This is a really boring kind of thing I were going to go into, which is essentially there's a new uh, recommendation out, the 18 things to do um, from the CIS, the Center for Internet Security, and they have the CSC critical security controls. But it, overall, for us running an organization in human talk, that's what we have to the uh, side here, which is essentially to defend something in an organization. You need to know what you have running on the networks. This could be through manual inventory or using scanners or whatever. You need to know what's installed on it. When you get it configured properly, maintain it that way. You need to do something in the space of uh, vulnerability management, patch management to keep it up to date. You need to do configuration audits on it. After that, pretty much all of it is about keeping track of what actually happened in the environment later. So keeping track of your network, keeping track of uh, your logs, but also ensuring that there's a good room of error for your users. So it shouldn't be the end of the world if Karen in finance clicks a link or downloads malware or even gives up her credentials provided, like Stina said, all users should not have access to all information. Um, if we look to the ransomware, which is the main topic of today, uh, which is largely due to it being very, very visual, uh, in the same way as we talk about bombs exploding in Sweden over normal domestic violence, for example, domestic violence is way more dangerous. Um, but the other one is way more visual. 
uh, we have here with the uh, ransomware, it's a highly visual intrusion. And we must all remember that the same amount of intrusions likely happened before we just didn't notice because people were trying to monetize our information in other ways. The first generations of these systems, they just locked a computer. From there, they moved on to locking information that user can access in your network. Today, we have what we refer to as APT-like actors. These are uh, threat actor groups who will uh, land on your network. From there, they will move through abuse of credentials or other vulnerable systems to bury rather deep. And then they will drop uh, the... Uh, ransomware at that point when they have a good access in the organization. So defense in depth is critical here. I'm moving in the wrong direction here. Uh, Stina has already covered the colonial pipeline. So I will be very brief on this one and more focus on what happened throughout this incident, where we can see that they may have paid 5 million, but the ransomware as a service platform, they had a turnover of $90 million in Bitcoins through these accounts. Um, and that's for that one single provider. Um, it's also a fun fact in this case is that uh, Colonial Pipeline, whilst they got the uh, decryption tool, it was way slower than just restoring data from their backups. So they ended up running their web backups, even though they paid for the decryption tooling. When it comes to phishing, and what we're looking at there, it's, uh, I mean, we encounter it in different forms. Um, we can see that this is a rather simple, straightforward one. Um, this one hit the entire organization here. They were asking for contacts for getting gift cards. So I reached out trying to figure out who they were, what they were after. And it turns out in this case, they're just after like getting uh, a um, prepaid card for um, a few hundred euros or similar not worth any effort in our end. The important bit I wanted to show here is that a simple email setting allows all our staff to see that caution, this email originates from outside of the organization. Do not click links or open attachment unless you know it's safe. This saves us so much effort uh, when it comes to these things. And it's what I'm talking about when it comes to defense in depth. We also seen um, CFO frauds where uh, a uh, head accountant were out of office and a junior accountant had just started. And here we see how an attacker who's been stalking this organization, monitoring them for a while, identifies this situation. The organization also has an issue, which means that their so-called SPF sent a perfect forward, uh, forwarding here, ignore that technical bit, but essentially it means I can claim to be that organization whenever I'm sending an email, but I will not be able to receive a response for that. Um, when I'm sending the emails, they wanted interaction. So they set up an almost lookalike domain, put that on the CC list, emailed as the head accountant to the junior accountant and order transfer of money. Um, we work with them in other cases. So they are experts in the financial bits. They managed to reach out to bank security and actually managed to freeze the money in transit a few jumps away from them and get their money back. Um, we managed to reach out to the attackers uh, to show them proof of transaction, and we got to their computers, which were running out of an internet cafe in Central Africa, and that's where we dropped it, because we have no chance ever of getting these guys. Um, essentially, they were very advanced for that region of attackers, um, but essentially not much to do about it in that case. Most of the money is back and secured. This page here, login, microsoftauthenticate.com, and this page here, login.microsoftonline.com, they seem very similar. Uh, they should, because we spent a lot of effort on that. One of them belongs to the Atlas 24 Gilstab red team, uh, or did for nine months until we burnt it in a test where, uh, in the end, Microsoft got um, news about that and wanted their domain back. But essentially, we can't blame any employee for going to microsoftauthenticate.com and authenticating and losing access to their accounts which is also why we talk about this defense in depth. The fact that I just landed on somebody's single account in the organization shouldn't mean that I move from the finance team or marketing team or sales team and get to the operations environment. So it just shouldn't be possible. So it's something everybody needs to take into account, assume that this breach is going to happen.
When it comes to exposed systems, uh, I mean, as an organization today, we track roughly uh, 225,000 vulnerabilities. It's uh, not all of them will give us access to a network. That's only around uh, 70, 80,000 of these ones, but it's sufficient amounts. Um, we can see it when it comes to the uh, Axelion um, hacks or intrusions. A known vulnerable system, which uh, whilst the news started going out, there were still systems up for a few months and ransomware groups moved in not to encrypt the information, but to steal it and then extort money from organizations not to release their customer information. But we've seen the same uh, if we look to SCADA. So these are small devices controlling power, fuel, um, air, water, and heating. Uh, so the Madrid airport, for example, remained vulnerable for more than a year after we issued updates for these controllers with the uh, vendor, um, Honeywell, in that case. The same case occurred for uh, the army of one of the European countries where we could still access their uh, IT management environments um, more than a week after, I mean, this is less of a timeline, but um, at the point, um, we could actually have reconfigured a large part of that country's armed forces IT environments due to these uh, exposed systems not getting patched in a timely manner. Of course, our exploits for these ones, so the way for an attacker to get in, were not released until these rather critical systems were off the internet. When it comes to cloud breaches and everything we read there, usually nothing is wrong with the cloud. Uh, as Tina said, everything just works. The problem is that people using the cloud don't realize the boundaries of their responsibilities. Um, people set up systems with their databases exposed to the internet or without firewalls or just out to deploy something based on an available tool to their development organization and it pops up in a vulnerable state and it's just not tracked. So going to the cloud realizes a good understanding of the cloud. Um, the cloud in and of itself isn't insecure, but all our 20, 30 years of experience in running proper IT operations seems to not apply to organizations moving there unless they thought it through. So spend some effort there. Uh, this is the last few slides, last few minutes of what I've been talking about, which is the time. But the reason I figured it would fit here is that the audience here, according to Gustav, is from the financial sector. Tiber is, uh, as mentioned, threat intelligence based ethical red teaming. Um, it was released by the European Central Bank in 2018. It means that you should test stuff that's relevant to you. Yes, I can most likely fly a drone, drop it on the roof of your building, spend three days there with my pineapple device to pick up wireless signals and try and fool your employees to connect to my wireless networks. Very few Russian hackers have done so in reality. Mostly they will send an email to somebody in the organization and try and breach. So let test for that because that's where you should be spending your effort that's where you need to uh, shape up so it's about doing targeted testing to enact realistic scenarios for the organization you're looking at if we look to donald rumsfeld who said there's three kinds of facts here where there are no knowns things that you know that you know there are the known unknowns. It could be that you acquired a small company. You do not know the condition of that network yet. So let's not allow them full access to our network yet. We know that we have some servers. We haven't spent too much effort on that one over there. So let's not expose other things to them. But the really dangerous ones are the unknown unknowns, the stuff we do not know that we missed when we did our security. Um, and essentially, that is what you're trying to target when you perform these forms of tests. So we have, for example, Rear Admiral Harry E. Janet, who demonstrated in 32, he showed how an attack on Pearl Harbor would work if the Japanese fleet would attack. He showed that to the army. And of course, they analyzed this and they said, it is doubtful if air attacks can be launched against Oahu. And essentially he were ignored, but at least they knew and they had done a realistic testing. And from that, they could model attack and they could have taken precautions and prevented this. For red teaming, it's different from other testing because it will, for an organization, test the cyber, physical, and human security, phishing, social engineering, bribery, maybe not blackmailing, and that's rude. Uh, disgruntlement. Um, hackers, ransomware, malware, espionage, 
and your alarm systems, camera systems. Usually the combination cyber physical is extremely efficient when we actually have somebody go on site. There's going to be kiosks, nobody maintained. There's going to be HVAC systems for running your elevator. Uh, I know whenever I go to uh, Copenhagen, I check to see if they've patched the uh, elevator in the hotel I usually stay, which was patched two years before they constructed the building. It's still not patched. So for red teaming versus penetration testing, um, we work in both spaces, but I mean, uh, the question, can you bypass my pick proof high security lock? No, there's likely nothing wrong with that pick proof high security lock, but in the context of how it's used in this operating organization, it's completely pointless. And that's essentially just a visualization of the difference between the penetration testing versus uh, red teaming as such. Um, I will leave it at this point um, due to time constraints. I would love to talk to uh, anybody who's here if they have questions, if they're starting to look into uh, mapping attack surfaces or technical controls, uh, web application security, where we are um, one of the uh, leaders in securing mainly banks, financial institutions, EID providers, and so on. Um, when it comes to a uh, more premium uh, segment where we live with working jointly with their teams for roughly a year in a row, um, running automated attacks, monitoring and emulating uh, cyber attacks against their web applications. Um, so if anybody's looking into that space or anything else we talked about today, I would be happy to uh, pick it up as a discussion. And I will hand it back to you now, Gustav. All right, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, very interesting. Um, so I think we have about um, sort of 30 minutes left. Um, so we have a few questions that we got. Um, so one question here is for Anders. Um, uh, Anders, uh, should companies uh, provide more transparent and detailed disclosures of strategies and specific risk mitigation practices? they're using to manage cyber risk? Well, I don't know how specific they should be, but they, they should uh, at least tell the, the shareholders what they have done and how they have protected their, their assets. So um, th that could be some kind of words that the chairman and CEO say, we have things under control, we have bought the best system, and we think at least that we have done what we have uh, are able to do, but how specific they should be, I'm, I'm not willing to discuss that actually, but, but uh, it's necessary that they take this question, question so seriously that they are willing to uh, describe that in an annual report, for example. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps I move on to Aaron then, if we pick up on that question. Today we have uh, sort of the DORA, which uh, covers the financial sector. Uh, we also have regulation regarding um, companies that are critical to the society, but not really a, a legislation around publicly listed companies. Uh, might we see leg legislation that re more in detail specify or require reporting and disclosures? Um, I wouldn't be surprised actually if, if this was, was supposed to be the next step. I don't think that Finance Inspection will be involved because we, we, we mainly conduct supervision regarding financial companies. But but I can but 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 we have seen over the last couple of years, like like I mentioned earlier, uh, much more extended regulations. So so it wouldn't surprise me uh, if we would see more regulations uh, concerning also uh, companies that are not financial or or that are not. Uh, uh, mm, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a question here also for uh, Martin. Um, uh, so picking up on the point of, of ransomware, um, sh should it essentially be illegal or uh, uh, illegal to pay ransom for, for a company or for a cyber insurance company? Or how do you, what's your opinion on, on, on that paying ransom? It's, um, it runs down to more of an ethical statement than a technical statement. If I've spent 10, 15 years building my organization and choosing to uh, 
not paying that ransom will mean my organization no longer exists. That's something we can't really ask of an individual. It's the same thing that you can be opposed to paying terrorists, but if they have your family, you will be very inclined to pay because now you're the one at risk. Um, when it comes to uh, the insurance bit, that could also be both an advantage and drawback. If we have organizations who choose to decrease their risk by getting insurance instead of taking technical measures, there is no incentive and driver and it's just going to be extremely expensive and it's not it's just not going to work out for the insurance companies this is also most likely going to be the savior because a serious organization will decrease impact decrease risk by fixing their networks getting access control in place and then getting insurance to take care of the remaining risk and those organizations should have access to this so most likely insurance companies are going to put a very high premium for doing a poor security work and thereby driving an incentive to manage this in a proper way within organizations. So yeah, I hope for the insurance business to clean it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question here for Stine as well. It was regarding the, the sort of the pandemic, the COVID-19 situation, um, sort of how has that impacted um, the cyber attacks that maybe specifically the phishing attempts from your perspective? Uh, thank you. As, as you saw on one of the graphs, it's increased. And there are two reasons for that. One is that you know, phishing attacks have become more sophisticated and they've become more in, in numbers. Um, and uh, they've been actually also more automated. <laughs> there are, you know, the bots that just can do it at a, you know, at in, as, you know, I think Google mentioned there were 18 million um, phishing attacks more per day due to the pandemic. Um, and um, then the, the risks have increased because we've moved from fairly secure, in some cases, fairly secure company environments where there had been you know, security tools and processes that were designed for the closed office with firewalls and, and VPNs and, and, and you know, just computers that maybe you could only access from the, uh, from the office. Now, when you move it uh, to your home, uh, most of it to the cloud, you may not you know, brought the best security practices with you. If you're sitting at home, you may share your computer with your family member. And there is an example of a CEO who, who literally had his son playing a fun game on his computer. And that fun game uh, had installed a spyware. And, and so there was a breach. Um, you know, at home, you may not sit on the same secure network connections. You, you know, you, the, there are a lot of things that unfortunately has, the security hasn't really come cashed up with the cloud environment that we're all dependent on today. Uh, but it's getting, it's getting better. And a lot of the cloud service we're seeing today are, can in many cases be, have better security than the offline system. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily that we've moved everything to a less secure world. It's just that, uh, some of the security measures haven't really caught up. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I got a, another question here for um, Finances Bekonen, Aron. Um, uh, you mentioned in your report that there should be clearer incentives for financial institutions to participate in collaboration. Just curious, what are those incentives that you might be sort of looking at? I mean, when, when it comes to incentives, we, we could definitely encourage through dialogue and so on. But uh, I mean, the, the ultimate incentive, if, if you're asking a financial supervisory authority, are sanctions, fines. Uh, so I mean, what, what we can do in, in the first case is, is to like, like conduct dialogues, encourage people to, to, to uh, um, develop uh, uh, standards, industry standards, but if that doesn't work uh, and, and we can see that binding regulations are not that hard to, uh, that, then, then we, we uh, would issue uh, sanctions in, in the form of fines. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Anders, um, I'm regarding sort of uh, non-Swedish equities in your portfolio, um, is there another 
sort of approach where you can do cybersecurity governance <coughs> in those companies or in international collaborations? Uh, when it comes to non-Swedish equity, AMF had to admit we are a very small owner. And I have this favorite story when I tried to call a CAO at the, in London. And I told the switch, uh, switchboard uh, lady that uh, my name was Sancho Oskarsson. I would like to speak to CEO. And she said, wouldn't we all? And she hung up. And so it's not so very easy for us as a big, uh, as an owner in, in uh, where we are a small fish, so to speak, to, to get those contacts. But what we try to do at least is we write letters uh, to the CEOs and uh, mention those things. But uh, uh, it's in company where we have big holdings. So it's more differently than we do in Sweden, actually. Mm -hmm. Would you perhaps do would you perhaps see a need for more sort of um, international investor collaborations or industrial initiatives around going together? Or do you find that that's um, sufficient today? But, but again, uh, the slide that uh, Stina showed, uh, number two, that hackers destroy value, that will be uh, something that more investors will uh, realize and uh, put pressure on the management team or the boards to take this uh, question seriously. What I just mentioned that in Sweden, we have a different way of uh, having contact with the board and have a direct shareholder contact with the board. And that's why we are doing this uh, thing differently when it's in, in Sweden. But again, uh, the more things that we see as a colonial, et cetera, we, I'm sure that the other investors will take this uh, matters up uh, into discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we only have three minutes left. Is there any sort of final question to the, that I asked the panelists? Anything you would like to sort of bring up um, or a question that you like to ask? If not, then I think that we are actually ready to wrap this up. Um, so first of all, I just like again to say a big thank you to Nasdaq and Ubico for taking the initiative to this webinar. Um, I also want to thank all the panelists for participating. So uh, with that, I say thank you for today. <laughs>